than they've gone in the past. And why do you care? I mean, you know, we've got established clinicians here, residents, medical students, everybody's headed for a career. Why do you need presentation skills? Because the way we present ourselves, especially early in our career, will either open doors for us, give us all sorts of opportunities, or they find somebody else. So as I said, this could be the most important hour of your training program. OK. This is so important that at Mayo Clinic, the institution invests time in our students, our residents, and our new staff to learn these skills. They block our time, and we do workshops for all these different groups of people. Why would Mayo Clinic spend this kind of time on all of this infrastructure? Because when we present ourselves well, it raises the brand. When you do something well, they look, where did she train? Oh, she's from Emory? Wow, they're good there. And the same at Mayo Clinic. So it's very important. This is something that uh, time is invested in. Every medical student has to take a workshop that we put on to graduate. And we offer it to everybody from our residents to our new staff. So how did I get interested in presentation skills anyway? I mean, I'm a general internist like many of you. Where did this come from? Well, a couple of years ago in 1969, I was asked to be the speaker at my high school graduation. It didn't go very well. <laughs> and I thought, that couldn't be me. It had to be the audience. Maybe I'll get better at this. So I went off to Rice University. And while at Rice University, I kind of changed my opinion on many things. In fact, I changed my appearance from entering to graduation. Uh, as you can see here. Uh, you know, Dr. Parton was asking if he could get the glasses and shirt. He thought maybe if he hung out at a watering hole around here, young people would come up to him. But I'm holding on. It might go in style again. But while at Rice University, I had an opportunity to listen to a speaker whom I'll never forget, not just because he was a famous sports figure, but in those days, before pugilistic Parkinson stole his voice, Muhammad Ali was the most recognized person in the world, more than the Pope and more than the President. And not just because he was a famous athlete, but when he was exiled from boxing, he could command a crowd. He spoke at college campuses. He only graduated by a thin thread from Louisville High School, third from the bottom of his class. I think they just let him out. But he was a great speaker. I figured if he could speak well, maybe I could take training and get better. So I took courses, I've practiced, I've written articles on this topic, and it's from what I've learned the hard way I want to share a few things with you today. So today we're just going to do a didactic. It's not a workshop. I'll, I'll share a couple tips on presenting yourself better and your presentation better. And then if we have time, I'm going to show you a little critique opportunity that we did with one of our medical students to, to show you what we do in our workshop. And I'll give you a chance to do some critiquing. So my goals today, now I thought this was clever, you know, putting that on the goals. Listen, I'm at the end of a mediocre career. Give me a little love. I thought I was <laughs> trying to be funny. But anyway, my goals today are to get your buy-in and teach you a couple things. But really to motivate you to put your presentations together a little differently than you've listened to and maybe done through the years. I'll try to demonstrate these skills. But after today, you will be better at critiquing others and yourself. And I'm going to black the screen. Boy, she was fabulous. But that other guy was boring. Well, those aren't, those aren't critiques. Those are opinions. A critique is more like a dissection. Well, why was she fabulous? Well, she smiled. She had energy. She knew that we were all in internal medicine. She only had three take-home points. She illustrated each with a case or a story. She had slides, but they weren't overwhelming. What, I don't care what she speaks on. I'll try to make it next time. What was wrong with the other guy? He spoke really fast with an accent. I had trouble understanding him. He didn't know what we're interested in. He spent 20 minutes talking about the diffusion coefficient in an agar plate. 
I was checking my email and my iPhone within the first two minutes. His slides were overwhelming. What a waste of my time. So that's what can go well or maybe not so well when you present. Do you think about body language sometimes when you're with patients or when you're teaching? A lot of times we don't, but you've all seen TED Talks, I imagine. TED speakers always speak with what we call an open posture. So what do I mean open posture? Uh, is the mic on up there? Uh, <laughs> What, what do I mean open posture? Anybody? Yeah, right, but it's easier to almost say what it isn't. Open posture means nothing between you and your audience. So if you've got your arms folded, clasped, this, this, and the ultimate closed posture is standing behind one of these big boxes when you speak. What do they call these boxes? Yeah, a lot of people say podium, so you know that's probably wrong. Uh, yeah, actually, it's called a lectern. Now, think of the Olympics. Would the woman from Canada please come to the podium to get her gold medal in speed skating? So that's the riser. The box is the podium, or the box, I'm sorry, is the lectern. Now, if they call you to the podium at the airport because they're going to give you a better seat or an upgrade, don't correct them at that time. <laughs> Take the upgrade, smile, and thank them. But now you know you can collect your friend, correct your friends. So great speakers use an open posture. They don't stand behind this. Hands don't have to be wide out. You do with your hands what you do when you're talking to friends and family. We often don't even think about what we're doing. A couple things about yourself and your credentials. Wherever, whenever you speak, always include an email address on a whiteboard, on a handout, on a slide. What's that tell your audience? <laughs> yeah, you're, you're approachable. You can be contact. Why are people afraid to put their email out there? Yeah, how many do you get a day? Do you want to triple it? It is never abused, never abused in a professional audience. You rarely get anything, but it makes you look good. And when you do, it's pretty good. Wow, that was a great presentation. You know, we put on a meeting every year in Hawaii during the winter. We'd love to fly you and your family over, you know, and we'll cover all the expenses. Or that was a great research presentation. We're doing similar things at Mayo Clinic. I bet if we combine our data, we could get published in annals. So it's always good. You rarely get contacted. Write your own introduction. Uh, I don't know how many of you, uh, when you're younger, you, not as often, but later on you have opportunities to speak. They want your curriculum vitae, they want your disclosures, and it goes into a box somewhere, and then somebody runs up to you right before you speak, and they go, uh, is it Higadorn, uh, uh, Jordan, Jason, tell me about yourself. I got to introduce you in about 30 seconds, and it doesn't go well. So the intro, do you still have that? The intro is... Not very long. You know, we've all been at these grand rounds presentations where the introduction was longer than the presentation. Nobody cares. Give yourself a little credibility. Talk about what you're going to speak about. If I were speaking about cases from the anticoagulation clinic like I often do, it wouldn't be this intro. It would be NIH sponsored for stroke prevention atrial fib trials. Founding member of the Mayo Anticoag Clinic. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Litton who will share cases with you. If you don't see this week in clinic, you may see next week, that kind of a thing. And then finally, what have I learned about the name badge? A couple of things. First of all, when you are presenting formally somewhere, oops, can't even put it on. You can see I'm not a proceduralist. When you're presenting formally, lose the badge. It looks stupid. Nobody can read it. It reflects life. And anything on your person that is distracting will detract from your presentation. But now it's time to meet and greet people at the coffee break and that sort of thing. Debbie, can I borrow you for a minute? So now I was always taught, 
when it's time to meet and greet, here, why don't you come from this side? When it's time to meet and greet, I was always taught to wear the badge in the upper right. And the reason is, just leave. The reason is she can take a peek at my name, tell me, Scott, that was a fabulous presentation. And I'd think, oh my goodness, she's a bright woman. I got to get her name. And if we weren't friends, I might get one of these. If you this usually gets a little bit of a laugh, but you guys are killing me here. This is all I have left. And where are you supposed to look, colleagues, when the badge is down here? This could be a little creepy for everybody in the room. So we, we mentioned upper right when you're, when you're meeting and greeting, but lose the badge when you're not. So give Debbie a hand. She's a good sport. We, we worked on that. All right. How many of these have you sat through, through the years? Other than this one, they can be pretty overwhelming, pretty addicting, and pretty annoying. But a college professor surveyed 1,000 students and asked them, what do you find most annoying sitting through these PowerPoint presentations? And uh, at the risk again, I'll try for a little audience, pre uh, a little audience participation. But before I share what they could answer, and they could answer more than one, what do you all find most annoying sitting through these things? Okay, the speaker reading the slides to you. Anything else? Yeah, too much stuff, too small. Yeah, waving things. So let's see what the student let's see what the students said. They could answer more than one. But the number one issue was the speaker reading the slides to you. Worse yet, facing the screen reading the slides to you. Now, you know how to adjust the point type in your slides. If you don't, the children next door will stop over and they'll help you. <laughs> but if you've got 18 lines on a slide, it's got to be tiny to fit. Have you heard the rule of five or six in, in your uh, teaching slides? No more than five or six lines, no more than five or six words per line, because we need not have the slides typed out in completely full sentences, worse yet, paragraphs. People love red, but certain colors really don't project. A lot of times, red takes it right off the screen. You don't have to be colorblind to see that. I use custom animation up here, but not these fly-ins. That can be very disturbing. And you've never been at a presentation where the speaker said, oh, let me apologize for this next slide. I, I know you can't read it in the back, but. And then you, you kind of fog out. Presentations aren't journal clubs. This is very rarely helpful to you making a point. But if you have to use some sort of a graphic like this, at least cut it down or custom animate. Just some basics. Your, your, your headers should be big. Books will tell you your text point type can be 24 to 32. I try to only use 32 or bigger. This is 24 and this is 28 point. You're going to run on with your sentences if you use small point type. I use a font. Remember, font is the design of the lettering. Point type is the size of it. I use a font that's a sans serif font. I use Arial. What's a serif font? Does anybody know what a serif font is? Yeah, it's the decorative, the feet, the doodads coming out of the at lettering like Times New Roman. It's just harder to read. And for heaven's sakes, avoid what we call the laser moth. When somebody takes their laser pointer and they're all over the slide until someone in the back of the room has a seizure and they feel like they caused it. So you never need a pointer on a word slide. That's where custom animation helps you, OK? Oh, I almost forgot. Avoid slide -ument. A slide is where they ram a document into the slide because they need this for the handout. One of our third year med students worked with a GI physiologist, and they studied this. If you stare at a slide like this for more than 40 seconds, <laughs> it will begin to cause diffuse abdominal cramping and explosive watery diarrhea. So I'm going to move the slide along here. So some people like to animate with uppercase, bold, color, just not the whole thing. All right, when you go to a teaching presentation, 
and you walk out of there going, boy, that was good. I'm gonna, I, I'd like to listen to that person again. Or, what a waste of my time. Why did I go to that? It's likely because the people either followed or ignored the following tips. And these are the tips that we critique our speakers on in our workshop. So the number one tip, know your audience, meet their needs. When you speak, it's not about you, what you're interested in, what you want to speak about, and how much material you can cover. It's about the audience and what do they want to know or need to know, not how much do you know. So when I speak, everybody is tuned into an FM radio station, WIIFM, Atlanta, Georgia. You know what the call letters stand for? What's in it for me? When I speak or when you speak, people are looking at us asking three questions. So what? Why would I possibly care about this? What's in this for me? If you answer that early on, we call it a hook. If you hook the audience, they want to hear more. They feel they need to hear more. We'll talk about the hook in a little bit. But this is what can happen when a speaker is not paying attention to or thinking about the audience. In 1930, the Republican-controlled House of Representatives, in an effort to alleviate the effects of the, anyone, anyone, Great Depression, passed the, anyone, anyone, tariff bill, the Hawley-Smoot Tariff Act, which anyone raised or lowered, raised tariffs in an effort to collect more revenue for the federal government. Did it work? Anyone? Anyone know the effects? It did not work, and the United States sank deeper into the Great Depression. Today, we have a similar debate over this. Anyone know what this is, class? Anyone? Anyone? Anyone seen this before? The Laffer Curve. Anyone know what this says? This is my favorite it coming says up. that at this point on the revenue. Curve. All right. So we've all we've all been we've all been sitting through these for years. In fact, I've given some of these. But after today, I hope that none of us do because we're going to be thinking about the audience and what we can give to them, what they need to know, what they can take out of it. So how long? How long? does an audience give us before they make a judgment of us and our topic? What do you think? Two minutes. I heard two minutes, three minutes. Actually, it's eight to 30 seconds. So if you don't hook them early, out come the email, all right? Out come the email. So your opening statement is crucial. So for this, you know, if we stay connected, I'll make you a promise. I promise you'll walk out here with new tips, tips and techniques. Why do you care? Your career depends on that. Now, if that doesn't hook you, we videotape people shortly thereafter, so it can be a carrot or a stick. But the hook is, the hook is very important. So I'm going to black the screen again. So I see some <laughs> students and residents in the back. So let's say we're putting on a workshop for applying for residency. And I get in the room and go, oh, welcome to the workshop. You all have a handout there. It's got about 40 pages. Open to page one, and let's start with writing your name on the handout. You know, people, people are already, they're already not listening to you. They're, they're, they're zoning out. But what if, what if your hook was something like, listen, as a former program director, I can share with you the two things that if you put in your application will make a 75% difference with acceptance versus rejection. That's a hook. You want to know what those two, but before we get to those two things, let's go through a few of our application process. So now you're waiting for the two things. If you're doing a morning report, you might be talking about something that's not necessarily an exciting topic to all, like diarrhea. And if your opening is, good morning, today we're going to talk about diarrhea. Most people in the audience are going, Lord, take me now. But if you talk to the interns and say, OK, you grab the chart of your first patient. The chief complaint is three weeks of diarrhea. Oh my god, your heart sinks. You're thinking, 
what do I ask? What do I need to think about? What orders do I need to do? What testing? Well, over the next few minutes, we're going to cover all those. So if that's your first patient, you will be prepared when you walk in. Those are hooks. Those are hooks. How many facts do people walk out of a typical 30-minute presentation recalling by the time they hit the exit? Yeah, zero to three. Oh, my goodness. Zero to three. Why do we give presentations anyway? A second big error that we clinic, clinical teachers make is try to ram 30 facts in somebody's brain in 30 minutes. Doesn't work. If, you do, if that's your goal, you'll fail every time. But you can do a lot with a presentation. You can teach a procedure, an approach to a problem. You can review literature. You can get funding for your research. You can position yourself as the go-to person at Emory in that area. But if your goal is 30 facts in 30 minutes, you're going to fail every time. Oh, this is my last slide. Now we're done is not a strong closing. Neither, I, I saw some of you hopeful. No, no, we got more. <laughs> Neither is a picture of the new baby, the sunset, uh, the Atlanta Falcon Stadium, or a joke, some sort of a joke or a cartoon. Or so. A lot of people end with that. It's a total waste of time. If people remember anything from your presentation, they'll remember the end of it. So always say these two words. In summary, people awaken, they grab a pen, whatever you say next will probably be recalled. Jason, I, I missed the presentation. What do I need to know? What's the bottom line? That's usually your summary, okay? Concentrate on the delivery. If you've got slides, get away from the lectern, face the audience, try to get the slides between you and the audience so you're not facing your screen. You don't know what you sound like until you've been videotaped and watched yourself. And that's what we do in our workshops, and it's very telling. A lot of times people talk really fast because after all, they only give me 15 minutes to talk and I wrote a 40 page paper on this topic. It's very interesting to me and I don't really care if the audience needs to know it all or not. I want to tell them everything that I know about this topic and I don't know about you, but I get a little nervous when I'm in front of a big audience and the faster I speak, the quicker I get to sit down. Trouble with that pace. Well, I heard somebody thinking that the trouble with that pace is it's hard to follow. Listening is very difficult. In fact, one thing I know for sure, as captivating as I've been this afternoon, you're all daydreaming while I'm speaking. I'm daydreaming while I'm speaking. This happens. But if I go slowly, you can sort of weave in and out and not miss any key points. If somebody goes really fast, you tune them out, and out come the iPhone. The most important speech technique you can master when you <coughs> present is pausing. To a speaker, a pause seems eternal. To the audience, it's a, just a brief break. And knowing that you make guttural noises like um, ah, and filler noises, and pausing instead is the only cure. Hardest thing for medical presenters to buy, but every time you present, teaching, presenting to your patients, a treatment plan, it's a performance. Now, when I say performance, you don't have to sing and dance, but you want to at least look inviting and look friendly. So we, we suggest people smile. The audience wants to ask you questions after. They want to feel that you're one of them. But a lot of times the speaker is actually frowning, trying to remember that 23rd fact that the audience could care less about. If you can't be enthusiastic about a teaching presentation, a diagnostic plan, a therapeutic plan, how does anyone else care? Hand gestures. We talked a little bit about hand gestures. Be natural with them. 
Don't even think about what you're doing. You can drop one, open one, just try to avoid the closed posture. But you can also use purposeful gestures. You know, they're making pacemakers now the size of a postage stamp. They can tuck it right underneath the clavicle. Can't even see it. So you can use purposeful gestures. Stories are remembered. Facts are not well remembered unless they're tied to a story. Cases are wonderful stories that we have in medicine. In fact, our clinical pearls at ACP are cases with a teaching point. So people will think back and think about the case and remember the one teaching point. Pictures are always better than words. Does anybody get nervous when you have to present in front of a large group? In fact, poisonous spiders Electrocution and public speaking are three of the biggest fears of mankind. <laughs> but the one thing that you will find when we do our workshops and we videotape people and we watch them back, most anxiety doesn't show. They have rated speakers, the audience. Audience rate the speaker. Speaker rate yourself. One is cool, calm, professional. Five is shaking, sweating, nearly incontinent. <laughs> Most speakers think they're a four. Audience rates that same speaker a two. The biggest fear of the speaker is looking <coughs> ill-prepared, nervous. Biggest fear of the audience is being bored. But if you want to look a little less anxious, let's talk about posture. Okay, I'm going to black the screen for a minute. Uh, what I want everybody to do, let's see if I can do this without falling. And any orthopedic musculoskeletal work. I want everybody to stand up, face the screen, and pretend that I am introducing you to a large audience. Now, I'm reading what you wrote. So blah, 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 blah. First of all, you wrote this garbage about yourself. You should be smiling, because I'm making a judgment of you. Now, when you're getting introduced, what do you do with your hand? Well, we call this the fig leaf. <laughs> this does not look particularly professional. This one's the firing squad. And especially guys, I say, guys, get your hands out of the pockets. They're wondering, what is he doing down there? So we recommend, when you're getting introduced, stand, smile, hands at your side. Just try it for a minute. Stand, smile, hands at the sides. Remember, your introduction only goes about 20, 30 seconds. But don't your hands feel like blocks of wood? They just don't feel right. You can't. You're, you're using the, the chair. That, that, you're cheating. <laughs> you're cheating. They, they, oh, you know, the, the staff always cheat. The residents and med students. Are. OK. If you push your thumb and index finger together when they're down here, when, just when you're getting introduced, you're smiling, it's a little less block of wood feeling in your hand. But now it's time to speak. Scott, you're on. We recommend you just bring the hands up above your waist so you remember to use them. Why? We've had speakers stand for 30 seconds, 30 minutes, squeezing the thumb and index finger so tightly, the first couple rows see gangrene setting in. It's very distressing. Some speakers talk down here with their hands below their waist. That looks kind of silly, too, like, like penguins or seals. But don't just bring them up and then forget to use them, <laughs> sort of like a, you know, like a T. rex or a vestigial remnant. Bring them up, just think about you. OK, have a seat. We're almost done. Sometimes your voice can get a little dry. I think the neurologists say it's the parasympathetic Parasympathetics can kick in. So it's good to have a little water, tea, something like that to sip on to dry your Probably not a good idea to slam down a Diet Coke right before you speak. Not just the caffeine, but the bubbles could erupt at the wrong time. That can be a little bit humiliating. If I'm nervous, I want to make eye contact with somebody who appears to be happy to be in the room. Not everybody wants to be in the room. Sometimes attendance is taken. People are sick or didn't sleep well, or they're worried about a sick patient upstairs or a family member. But once you get your comfort level,
don't forget to look around the room, make eye contact here, down the middle, don't just stay at one spot, but not too quickly or you look shifty-eyed, dishonest, that doesn't go very well, okay? <laughs> if humor is part of who you are, like I thought it was for me before I met you characters, it's okay to use it. But if that's not you, don't worry. But if you use humor, make it appropriate. What's the most appropriate humor that we can use? Self-deprecating, Self absolutely. If you make fun of any other group, any other region, any other this or that, somebody will be offended. But if you point it back at yourself, the funny picture of myself graduating college, these are all the mistakes I've made, I share with you so you don't repeat my mistakes, you sound a little friendlier. I have found that oftentimes cartoons don't work if that's somebody's trying to be humorous. Oftentimes the speaker will go, oh, oh, oh this is a good one. I know you can't read it. Let me read this to you. Uh, I'm not a lazy bum. I'm a, a potential workaholic with <laughs> highly developed stress management skills. <laughs> yeah. You don't get much of a response there. Maybe a, a sympathy laugh or smile. But I found videos work if they're set up. So I set up that Ferris Bueller video, Ferris Bueller Day Off, because these are the presentations we've all sat through and died through. But like m most of you in the audience, I'm a general internist. Most of the people I see are elderly. And I like seeing old people. Heck, I'm one of them now. So I, I get along with them pretty well. But one of the things I try to stress with every older patient I see, I try to get them to laugh. Find humor, laugh every day. I don't know, I tell them they probably live longer. I guess the endorphins go up, the catecholamines go down, less strokes or heart attacks. But even if they don't live longer, they seem to live happier. So one of my patients sent me a video how she finds a little laughter in her life every day. Finally, I got a laugh out of this group. So that's kind of silly. It's kind of stupid. But people like videos, but you got to set them up. They, they just can't come willy-nilly. And I almost forgot an important keyboard secret. Did you notice at times I will black the screen? Where do your eyes go? Yeah, I mean, they go to the speaker. Now, I do that with a handheld. This is like an $80 Logitech because I don't like to stand next to my keyboard if I don't have to. But you don't always have to have a slide up there. You know, if I were sharing with you what I learned from a woman I cared for in hospice care on the final day of her life, when she whispered something in my ear that actually has changed my life forever, I don't want an elephant up there. That kind of detracts from the story. So that's where the key should go black, which is very easy to do. Do you all know how to do that? Yeah, the B key. So on your keyboard, B key, B for black. Any other key will bring it back. The W key is for white, but don't do that. You might precipitate a migraine in the audience, so you don't ever have to. But just simply black and white. You don't always have to have a slide up. And another powerful technique, have you ever seen the speaker with 20 slide, he's on slide 20 of 30, and the red light starts blinking. Now the time is up. What do they do with the last 10 slides? How do you feel with 10 slides running by you so fast you can't even think? You should always practice a presentation out loud with a timer, because if you're in bed at night, the laptop is on your lap, you're doing it in your head. You're trying not to wake a spouse, a roommate, a partner. It takes about this long. Then you get up there and it goes this long. 
But even when it's timed out, sometimes you start late, there's interruptions. The light blinks. We, t we teach people, just hit the B key. Oh, I see our time is short. I purposely put a little more in the presentation than I knew we'd have time to cover. But you've got my email address. And I'll be available at lunch. Let's wrap it up here. So in summary, and they think you're right on time. OK. Before we finish, I want to change gears. Get it? Change gears. I, God, I thought this would work. You know, this works up north. I don't know what it is. Uh, I want to change gears, and I want to share with you a little bit what we do in our workshops and give you a chance to do some critiquing. So a little opportunity to deliver some constructive critiquing over what we've just discussed here. So I'm going to give you a videotape example of one of our third year medical students who was on a research assignment. What we asked them to do is create a three minute presentation on anything. If it's going to be on something that they're interested in medically, we want them to give it to a general audience, not a bunch of sub-sub research specialists. And I ask them to remember the tips from this earlier presentation when they do this. And then we have everybody take a sheet of paper and they write a little, they make a little T bar on the paper and on one side is a plus for what went well and the other side is a delta for what changes could be made to improve. Where at Mayo Clinic there are no negatives, a negative thought gets you banished to Iowa or somewhere else. So it's only what went well and what changes for the better. So either with a piece of paper, if you have one, or in your own mind, think about what went well with the following speaker and what changes you might suggest that he could do in the future uh, to be better. And then we'll hopefully get a little participation afterward, and then we'll be done early. No one cares. No one cares if you end a little early. You go two minutes over, and they'll kill you. So here's our speaker. Good, Scott. To whom are you speaking today? A group of cancer researchers. And what's your goal? My goal is to uh, get them excited about why they should start clerking on you in the Yale Cancer Project. OK, whenever you're ready, begin. All right, good afternoon. My name is Scott Thompson. This afternoon, I'll be talking to you about uh, should stop clerking on you. What I want you to leave here with is an understanding of why should stop clerking on you in the Yale Cancer Target. There's three things I'm going to cover. First, what is C-Shock Clerking 90? Second, why have drugs failed in targeting this protein in the clinic in the past? And why do we have a lot to, uh, to be optimistic about uh, in terms of what's coming down the line? So first, what is C-Shock Clerking 90? I liken C-Shock Clerking 90 to all the cars and buses in a city. Without them, people can't get to where they're going. And in a cancer cell, the people would be these proteins. And cancer cells live and grow and evade things like cell death because of these proteins like HOC protein 90. And HOC protein 90 chaperones greater than 200 proteins uh, within a cell. And so you could think of it as targeting one protein but affecting many, many different processes within a cancer cell. Now, why have drugs for HOC protein 90 failed in the past? Well, there are two main reasons. The first is that they cause too much toxicity within the eye. And the second is that they cause too much toxicities within the liver. So these two things combined are what limited most of the drugs to this date uh, for blocking HOC protein 90 in the treatment of different cancers. Now, what do we have a lot to be optimistic about? Well, there are several drugs that are now coming down the line which are uh, distinctly different from the first generation of drugs that I just previously mentioned. One of which that we are working with is called Ganatesvig, and why we're very excited about this uh, particular drug for targeting HOC protein 90 in cancer is that the side effects that we saw with the first generation drugs, namely eye toxicity and liver toxicity, we do not see those anymore. And this drug in early stage clinical trials has shown amazing results in some of the most resistant cancers uh, that we, we you could think of, including triple negative breast cancer and other types of uh, non-small cell lung cancer. So really to summarize, there are three things that uh, I want to reiterate. HOC protein 90 is an ideal cancer target because it chaperones so many proteins within a cancer cell. And so by disrupting this one 
protein that you can disrupt many aspects of cancer, of what makes a cancer cell a cancer cell. Second, drugs in the past have failed because we have uh, had too much toxicities with the, uh, the first generation drugs. Again, I and liver toxicity. But we have a lot to be excited about because we have new drugs like Ganatester coming down the line which do not have the toxicities and are, sh are showing some amazing results in patients with uh, solid organ cancers. Thank you. Okay, so if you were gonna critique him, what we do is we often go around the room, we ask the speaker, him or herself, start out with a positive and then we go around the room. Then we go start, what would you change? And we go around the room. So we always start with positives first. What went well? And please speak up and somebody save me up here. Yeah, he was the poster boy for organization. We're gonna talk about three things, boom, boom, boom. To summarize, I, I like the words in summary a little better but because it wakes you up, but to summarize and he hit the three things, very organized. I'm sorry? He was good at hand gestures. Yeah. When he used the hands appropriately, they were pretty good. Even some purposeful things like the eye and the liver. And sometimes he did this. And we put that kind of on both sides of the ledger because there were a fair number of these and some of these. What were you going to say? Okay. Yeah, good summary, good close. Dressed ultimately professionally, got rid of the name badge, no distractors on him, made him look very, you know. A lot of times, you know, the look is a big thing when somebody has the lapel out of whack or a pocket out or hair over the eyes. That's all people look at and they get distracted. What changes? You know, some people said they also liked the, the visual of train cars and buses moving the proteins around, and that's what the, uh, the protein does. What would you suggest he could do to be better? Yeah, so breathe, yeah. We told him we were looking for gills because I, I didn't see many breaths. Uh, we were teasing a little bit. But you listen, when you hear presenters, Probably, especially up north, maybe a little less so in the south, but people speak either very, very fast, very fast, fast, or about right. No one, no one speaks too slowly. So one of the biggest things that people can do is simply slow down and pause. Because we're all daydreaming. We're all thinking in and out. It's hard to listen. And when somebody goes fast, it's hard. What else? Uh, eye contact. So eye contact, I'm sorry? Yeah. Well, here's my theory on this, and one of, my, one of my partners thinks I'm nuts, but my theory is when we're a little nervous, we tend to rock. Now, I hearken that back to when our mothers or grandmothers would rock us when we were fussy. Uh, this other partner of mine, uh, he actually is from New Jersey. He, he was left on the side of a highway as a child, suckled by wolves, and he never knew the loving mother's touch. But anyway, that's a whole nother story. But yeah, he rocked a little bit. We were taught, get a comfortable posture, and you've got a three-foot radius of extension. So if I want to walk this way and say, that was a great question, and I talk over here, then come back to base. We're not Oprah. We're not running to the audience. Just a quick, yeah, good, good, good idea. Let me make that point and back to baseline. Can anybody even tell me what the name of the protein is? Yeah, wh what are you, a cancer specialist? <laughs> okay, hey, heat shock protein 90. I didn't understand it. What was the new drug that they developed? He mentioned a drug, but it went by too fast. So when you're talking about something unfamiliar to most of the audience, but jargonistic to you or the group, go slowly. Heat, shock, protein, 90. And, and so that's what this was, but I didn't even understand it. What was his hook? He didn't have a hook. So what I advise him to do, if he's going to give this talk again, 
Another wonderful word is the word imagine. So you can start with a case. You can start with the word imagine. Imagine if there were a drug that was developed with very few toxicities that could actually unlock the key to curing many, many cancers. Well, colleagues, if our research comes to fruition, we have developed that drug. And over the next few minutes, I want to tell you about the drug and how it works. Boom, that's a hook. I mean, he's going to talk about the cure for cancer. That's exciting. But you've got to hook the audience. Just because you are speaking doesn't mean anyone cares. So you've got to hook the audience. So we recommended maybe a hook. So that's sort of the way our workshops work. We usually have four to five to maybe maximum of six because it's fun to get critique yourself, learn a few things, and it's fun to see three or four others, but not too many. So we talked about what went well and what could be improved. So in summary, <laughs> oh, I see the smiles now. If we only remember three things from what I covered today, please think about organization. Start with a hook. Make them care. A case, the word imagine, something. Limited number of facts, because they won't be remembered. And a strong, in summary to close, make it a performance. Smile. Speak slowly and comfortably. Use pauses. Insert stories, cases. And here's the most important thing. Your presentation skills are as or more important than what you present. And let me, let me do an exercise with you. I want you to picture in your mind someone who you've heard in the last year or two that you would classify as a really good speaker. Someone, if he or she were presenting again later in the week, you'd make an effort to go. Hopefully you've got a face in your mind, somebody. How many facts do you remember the last time he or she presented? You don't have to answer, I pretty much know. Yet when we make presentations like this, teaching presentations, the majority of us put most of our time putting facts on slides and very little of our time thinking about stories or way to connect with the audience. When it's really you that are remembered for a long time and the factual information isn't. You might be remembered as the go-to person in this area. He or she is a wonderful problem solver. They're friendly, they're funny, but all the facts aren't remembered. So with that, we'll close. Are there any comments, things that you've learned through the years or you've seen or any questions that anybody wants to raise? So what do you do when you're in a little group like this and you go, hey, great talk, Dr. Litton, wonderful talk. Are there any questions for Dr. Litton? And then there are none. So you see the speaker go, well, I guess I've been, I've been so clear or so confusing that there are no questions. You want to start with a hook, enter with a bang, you want to leave with a bang. So you've got two opportunities. Good, if there are no questions, let's summarize once again the three take home messages. Boom, 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 and then get out of there. Or if you're with a bunch of quiet people, uh, medical students, residents, Nobody wants to ask the first question. Well, you know, a question I'm often asked is, can we use these new novel oral anticoagulants in porcine valves, in non-mechanical valves, or do we need to stay away from them? And then you answer that. Usually hands go up. If they don't, get out of there, go to the car, and run away. <laughs> well, listen, if there are no questions or comments, <laughs> Let me once again summarize what we've talked about. Thank you for your attention. Have a good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Litton. And we do have seven minutes time for questions.
I'll, I'll ask one about the uh, font choices or the, the script type. The trouble I have with Arial is the capital L, I'm sorry, the, the lowercase L and the number one. And sometimes you have you can't figure out where you are on that. Yeah. And yeah. I know New York Times, uh, Times New Roman has been used. You, you mentioned that. Can you read from the back of the room? Baskerville Old Face uh, I've liked, but it's similar to Times New Romans. But Ariel, it, uh, it's not very exciting to me. So. <laughs> so what do you what do you do when you get a, a nice guy like Dr. Parton and, and he's kind of he's kind of ripping one into you? And what <laughs> what what do I do with that? So one way to handle and I'm teasing. That's not a diff, that's not an angry question. But sometimes people will come up and they'll be disagreeable. And what do you do with the disagreeable questioner? Clyde, that's a very good question you bring up. It's an opportunity for others to voice their opinion, though. Let's visit, because uh, I've got a lot to say on that. Let's talk about that outside the room at the end of the presentation. But let's see if there's some other questions out there. John. I don't know if you heard our colleague, but he just said this was one of the best grand rounds that's <laughs> ever occurred at Emory. And actually, they'd like to invite me back and, and do this over and over again. With, But the question was, what about visuals? Great presenters, no matter what your political view is, Martin Luther King, Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, Barack Obama, great presenters don't use PowerPoint. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address didn't use a PowerPoint. But let me tell you, I run a lot of medical meetings. For medical meetings, PowerPoint is still the currency. And if you don't get your slides in to wherever you're invited in time, you don't get invited back. But I think when we talk about visuals, the best visuals are pictures without words, but then if they want to put your PowerPoint up, they want an outline, so you can't really do that. And the best, Less is more, one word, one picture, something to illustrate a story. Because it really shouldn't be about your visuals. It really should be about you, your performance, your message, the way you present. But some people like Prezi, and Prezi is just PowerPoint that you can pull down in different areas. But in medicine, we're kind of one of the last bastions to continue to use PowerPoint. And probably in the future, that will go. But people always want the handout. They always want all the slides. Yeah. Does it make it a factor? What's the point of the PowerPoint? Do you mean, is it a, a summarized health structure? You're going to take something and give it to your faculty and, and put your back to it? And teach Got an another gentleman thought this was a great grand rounds. So I'm finally getting the love that I deserve. <laughs> What's the point of the PowerPoint? A lot of us use it as crutches for ourselves. A lot of fellows' presentations write the whole thing out, which isn't appropriate. But you're meeting the needs of your audience. And the needs of the audience, some people are visual learners, some people are auditory learners, some people aren't learners at all, some people want the handout, some people want this. So you're meeting the needs of the audience, meeting the needs of your organizers. But if your organizers come up with something that you think is ineffective, I think it's, it's our responsibility to share with them, that isn't going to work. This is the way I think people learn better. Yes? Uh, thanks for the presentation, Dr. Leighton. Um, question, if you are asked, if you are told that you need to stay behind that lectern because we're videotaping you, we don't want you to move away from there, and you need to stay there, what do you, how do you manage that? I find that very constricting. Yeah. And then we'll have a couple of questions from other sites. Well, hopefully, hopefully you can work with the AV people. One of the things our AV people share with us is get to the venue early. Because if you get to the venue uh, one minute beforehand, we can't work on the sound like we did today to make sure some of them need to be up regulated. Maybe they won't have a lavalier mic if you don't ask for it in advance. But if you are stuck behind this because you just have to be, you can still speak slowly, be enthusiastic, use your hands, 
use the gestures, but it does pull from the body. And so it's, it's suboptimal, but you don't have to grab onto the lectern like you're on the Titanic and this is the only thing you've got to save you. We have a, a question from Grady. They said, how do you recommend addressing a room of learners with a widespread of uh, knowledge, basically medical students, all the way up to seasoned experts in a field? One of the things that, one of the things that speakers or teachers often fear is there'll be people at such a higher level of knowledge than they that they either have to talk down or talk up or they'll lose people. Great speakers are able to sort of quickly bridge the gap and catch the new learner up and come up with some teaching points, usually through cases. Cases work much better than facts. And catch everybody up quickly and then come up with a case that they want the learning issue. I, I tell even our residents, when you have researched a topic thoroughly and you're updated on the literature, you know more than probably everybody else in the room except perhaps the author of the paper you're quoting. So that's oftentimes people fear that they won't know everything or that, they, that others know much more than they do. That's probably not the case. Okay, right. thanks very much. Go home and work on your PowerPoints. <laughs>